All right, it is 10, so let's get started for today. And just a reminder of um, what we were talking about on uh, Friday, uh, we were beginning to look at how to assign electron configurations for elements um, by reading the periodic table. Um, and reminder, we have an S block, a P block, and a D block. So we learned how to write the full electron uh, configurations. And then we talked about um, the truncated version where you could just use the uh, noble gas that's um, closest to the left of, of your element and then write the electron configuration from there. And we continue with that just seeing if we can determine the number of different electrons um, in these different orbitals for these elements. And then we looked at uh, Coulomb's law, which tells us if you have charged particles, what's the energy of interaction? Again, uh, negative energies are good, positive energies are bad for Coulomb's law. Now, what we're gonna talk about uh, today to begin with are the idea of valence electrons. So, Elements, atoms, generally have two different types of electrons. They have valence electrons and they have core electrons. Now, valence electrons are electrons that are in the highest energy shell. So if we look at our example of fluorine down here, our highest energy shell is two. You have two S and two P. And if you look at the number of electrons in the second energy level, you have a total of seven. You have two coming from the 2s orbital, and you have five coming from the 2p orbital. Two plus five equals seven. If you look at the lower energy levels, and fluorine, there's only one lower energy level, and that's one. Uh, those are called core electrons. So fluorine has two core electrons, that is two electrons in the lower energy level. And when we're talking about chemistry uh, and just properties of elements and the way that elements behave, it's really all due to these valence electrons. Um, and basically uh, a rule of thumb is that um, elements want to try and get eight valence electrons, which we call an octet. So fluorine currently has seven. So when it does reactions, it always wants to gain uh, one more electron to get eight valence electrons. Um, now, there are a lot of exceptions to what's called the octet rule. That's what I'm talking about here, the octet rule. But in general, a good way to begin to understand why atoms behave the way they do is that they are trying to get a full octet of electrons. All right, so we're gonna just work here at first just to determine how many valence electrons are in each element. Um, so I will do auction first just to uh, get us started there. So what you want to do is you want to write out the electron configuration of our elements. For oxygen, I'll write out the full electron configuration for oxygen, but you don't always have to use the full. But for oxygen, the full electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, then 2p4. Uh, One, two, three, four. So if we look, the highest energy level in oxygen is the second energy level. We see that our, there's two plus four electrons in the highest energy level. So this is a total of six valence electrons. So that's what we're gonna to start today. See if you can tell me how many valence electrons are in chlorine, sodium, and iron. So I'll give everybody a minute or two to work on that.
All right, so let's take a look at chlorine here. The electron configuration, I'm gonna write the truncated version off of this. Chlorine is neon, um, 3s2, 3p5, which is seven electrons. Sodium is neon, 1s, or not 1s, uh, 3s1, which is one electron. So oxygen, chlorine, sodium, uh, relatively easy to figure out. Iron is what's gonna throw off most of you, um, at least usually um, that's what throws off um, most chemistry students, right? So let me write out the uh, configuration of iron. I'm gonna write out the full one for this one. So iron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, uh, 3p6, uh, 4s2, and then it is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3p6. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yep. All right, so that is the... Um, electron configuration for iron. Now we have to look at the lowest, um, or sorry, the, the highest energy level here, right? And the highest energy level, you, I'm sorry, that's not 3p6, that's 3d6. That's 3d6, that's a d orbital. Now you might be um, tempted to say that the highest energy is that 3d orbital um, because it comes last. However, we go by the number in front. So the number of valence electrons in iron are two valence electrons. So that's a two, even though the last thing we do write is a 3d6. So any questions about valence electrons? Um, it'll be, it'll be the case for, uh, neutral iron. Yes. Um, but yeah, generally, um, how do you find them again? You, you just pick the highest energy shell and count how many electrons there are. Yeah. So for iron, the highest energy shell is the four energy. So that's a four S two. All right, so moving on from this then. So the last thing we're gonna talk about in uh, these series of slides before we next move on to the next slide, uh, slide show, is uh, the idea of shielding an effective nuclear charge, right? So the reason why electrons wanna be around the nucleus is that electrons are negatively charged and the nucleus has protons in it. However, the electrons that are furthest away from the nucleus, they're shielded from feeling the full force of the nucleus. Um, in the example here, we have three protons in the center and we have two electrons floating near it this furthest electron out here is being shielded uh, from feeling the full force of the nucleus because of repulsion. Remember, negative charges re repel each other. So the electron out here is feeling attraction, but it's also feeling repulsion. And so we have a term that will tell us what is the net amount of attraction that an electron is feeling, and that's called effective nuclear charge. 
And the way to calculate effective nuclear charge is, it's basically just the number of protons minus core electrons, right? So for our example out here, for the electron that's on the, our valence electron on the outside where our arrows are pointing, if we look at the nucleus, we have three protons and that blue cloud is telling us core electrons. So we have uh, two core electrons there. So three minus two is one. The effective charge that that electron is feeling on the outside is plus one. Right. So when we would do Coulomb's law, it's basically this electron is feeling a plus one charge from the nucleus and not a plus three. And that's because it is being shielded from the nucleus. So um, let's try to calculate uh, effective nuclear charge. Um, so I will do A again, but let's just read the question. So. If you have core electrons that completely shielded valence electrons from nuclear charge, that is, every core electron reduces the nuclear charge by one unit, and assuming that valence electrons did not shield one another from each other, what is effective nuclear charge for the valence electrons of each atom? Okay, so uh, just asking valence electrons, what's the effective nuclear charge? So let's see how we figure this out for potassium. So I hope everyone has their periodic table out. If not, this is going to be very hard. So potassium um, is element number 19, which means it has 19 protons, right? If we write out the electron configuration of potassium, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, uh, 4s1, right? So that's the electron configuration of potassium. So potassium has one valence electron and it has 18 core electrons. So the effective nuclear charge of this valence electron is the number of protons you have, so that's protons, minus the number of core electrons you have, which I'm going to call CE. We have 18 core electrons. So our effective nuclear charge, ENC, is 19 minus 18 is 1. Yep, so for our valence electron for potassium, we're feeling an effective nuclear charge of one. So see if you can follow that logic and determine the effective nuclear charge of calcium, oxygen, and carbon. So everybody take a few minutes to try and figure that out. So there is a question, wouldn't this be the same as the, uh, uh, the nuclear charge equals number of valence electrons? Um, for neutral atoms, that can be the case for sure. Um, it's not always the case though, if you have ions. So that's why it's a uh, good practice just to do the full form. So when we get a case when it's not, not that, 
um, we can make sure we do the calculation right. So looking at calcium, for example, so B has 20 protons and it has 18 core electrons. 20 minus 18 is effective nuclear charge of two. And how to figure out it has 18 core electrons. Um, again, you have to do Either you have to figure out how many valence electrons there are and kind of back calculate from that, or you can just write out the full electron configuration. Oxygen, oxygen has eight protons. It has two core electrons. Eight minus two is effective nuclear charge of six. And carbon, carbon has six protons. It has two core electrons. Eight minus two is, sorry, six minus two is four. So it has an effective nuclear charge of four. Which as pointed out for neutral atoms, um, it's actually just um, how many valence electrons you have, but there can be, um, you'll get different calculations when you start to work with ions and such. But any questions on calculating effective nuclear charge? Okay, if not, we will move on. All right, and so the last thing we are gonna talk about, let me just double check that, yeah. Um, is this idea of uh, penetrating electrons, right? So electrons are negative, the nucleus is positive. And so electrons really don't wanna be on the outside shells if they can help it. And what will happen is that sometimes electrons will jump from the outer shell and then force them way, their way into the inner shells. Um, this is called uh, penetrating, right? You're, you're penetrating the inner shells um, from your outside position. What does this mean for us? Well, what that means is that uh, the energies of sublevels are not degenerate, that is, the reason why we have these energy gaps, why the 2s and the 2p orbitals are not the same energy is the idea of penetration. That is, s orbitals can penetrate easier than p orbitals. Um, and it has to do to their probability distribution, right? And what this means is that some energy levels, like the fourth energy level, um, is actually 4s is actually lower in energy than 3d, right? And the higher you go up, the actually the less this this matters, um, because energy levels just become stacked on each other. Um, but the takeaway from these series of slides are: it is possible for an electron to go from the outer shell to the inner shell, that's called penetration. And this is why our energy diagram looks the way it does. That's why not all two uh, level two energy uh, orbitals are the same level. That's why not all the three energy levels are the same level. But I actually don't have a question for this. Um, so we will move on to our uh, next PowerPoint. So let me, let me get that uh, loaded up right now. Yeah. So 
we've been talking about the electron configurations of atoms. And I already mentioned the octet rule um, at the very beginning of class. And like I said, once you understand um, the octet rule and you understand electron configurations, that's when you really start understanding why uh, atoms behave the way they do. And that also helps us to understand why the periodic table is laid out the way it does. Um, for example, our noble gases, 8A, they have a full outer shell, right? Um, their, their outer shell have eight electrons other than helium, which has two. That since they have a full outer shell of electrons, they are perfectly content with the number of electrons they have. Um, they don't want to gain electrons. They don't want to lose electrons. So because of this, our noble gases are inert. They don't want to react because they don't need to gain or lose electrons. Our group one metals, you can see that we always have one electron in our outer shell. If we were to lose that electron, we would have the same electron configuration as noble gases. So our group one metals really want to lose that electrons. That's why group one metals are always cations. They're always plus one. And we talked about this way at the beginning of, of our semester here, but I never explained why that is. Now I can, now that we understand electron configurations. Our alkali metals want to lose that one electron so they can have the electron configuration of noble gases and they have a full octet. Group two metals, same idea. They have two electrons in their outer shell. If they lose those two electrons, they gain the electron configuration of our noble gases. And so in reactions, our group two metals are always gonna be plus two. They wanna lose those two electrons. Our halogens, our group seven nonmetals, they have seven electrons in their outer shell. So if they gain one more, they would have the electron configuration of our noble gases, right? And so these are always minus one because if they gain that one more electron, they um, would, would um, have the same electron configuration as our noble gases. So in general, your metals and your non-metals want the electron configuration of noble gases. Uh, transition metals, they're a little more tricky, but uh, group one, group two, you know, group 5A, 6A, 7A, they generally want to try and become like the noble gases. And that's why we can actually predict their charges, right? At the very beginning of the semester, I said, you know, we can predict charges of certain elements. And this is why they always want to get the same electron configuration as our noble gases. And here's a chart that I've shown before. Um, these are the charges that atoms form, right? Group one plus one, group two plus two. Uh, aluminum plus three, nitrogen minus three, group six A minus two, group seven A minus one. They just want to get the same electron configuration as their nearest noble gas. So what we're going to do is we're going to just write electron configurations for ions to make sure we understand one. Um, you know, again, what does an ion mean in terms of uh, electrons, and also this idea of becoming like your noble gas. So let's start with oxygen, and you don't have to do this but I'm going to write the electron configuration of neutral oxygen first, and then just show you uh, minus two. So neutral oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p4. If it's oxygen minus two, that means it's gained two electrons. So oxygen minus two is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, because it's gained those two electrons and you always put those electrons in the outermost shell, right? 
So I'm gonna give everybody a few minutes again. See if you can write down the electron configurations for B, C, D, and E. And for this, you don't have to write out the full electron configuration if you don't want. We can always just do the abbreviated version. Uh, so Br minus means I gain one electron. So our, our electron configuration is going to be argon. Then 4s2, 3d10, and uh, 4p6 which has the electron configuration of actually, that's krypton. SR2 plus, well, if we're two plus, that means we lose two electrons. So if I go and lose two electrons, that would be um, actually the same as bromine, which is just Kr. So as the electron configuration of the krypton, which is the same thing as bromine. Right, cobalt three plus. This is gonna be tricky. Um, so I'm gonna do the same thing I did for oxygen in that I'm gonna write out the electron configuration of uh, neutral cobalt. So neutral cobalt is argon. Argon 4s2. 3D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3D7, All right? So when you lose electrons, you generally lose them from the highest uh, energy shell first. So our highest energy shell here is the uh, 4S. Um, so we're gonna lose our electrons from there first, generally. 
it doesn't always happen like that. Uh, the, the, there are some rules to go with that, but for right now, for Gen Chem 1, we're going to just be general here and say we're going to lose them from the highest numbered orbital first. So for 3 plus, we, use, we lose three electrons. So it's argon 3d6. We lost two from the 4s orbital and one from the 3d orbital for a total of uh, plus three, three lost. And copper 2 plus is the same idea, right? So copper, I'm going to rewrite it just for um, just so we can all see what's going on. So copper neutral is argon um, 4s2 uh, 3d9. So copper 2 plus, when I lose two electrons, that's going to be argon 3d9. All right, so there's the electron configurations of our um, ions. So when you're working with transition metals, make sure you take it away from the highest S level first before you move to the uh, D level. Again, um, there are many exceptions to this and uh, many uh, fine rules we have to follow to actually get it correct. But to start with, we're just gonna say, yeah, always take it from the um, highest numbered energy shell. So any questions about the electron configurations of ions? If not, we can move on. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is magnetism. Um, that is, why are some metals magnetic and why are some metals not magnetic? Um, and our technical terms for these are paramagnetic and diamagnetic. Um, so paramagnetic is magnetic. Diamagnetic is not magnetic. And what this really is dealing with is paired electrons, right? So when we write out our um, electron orbital diagram, and that's what this is, this is an electron orbital diagram. Remember, we have some rules that we need to follow. And one of the rules is when we're filling in a specific energy level, we want to make sure that electrons are unpaired first, right? And so what makes an element magnetic is if they have unpaired electrons. So in this example, we have four unpaired electrons. So this element we're looking at is paramagnetic. Right, this is magnetic, um, and all you need is one pair, one unpaired electron, and you don't need a certain number. All you need is one unpaired electron, and you are paired magnetic. So you only need one. While if everything is paired up, we call that diamagnetic, and you are not a magnetic element. Right, so paired magnetic and diamagnetic. So what we're going to do is we're going to write out um, uh, orbital diagrams and see whether we're diamagnetic or uh, paramagnetic. So I'm going to start with B5+. So B5+, is I'm going to, uh, let's take a look here. B5+, the actual configuration of V. So let's do V first. Again, you don't have to do the neutral atom first. I'm just doing it to show um, everybody, you know, exactly what's going on. So V is argon, and then it's 4s2, 
3D3, uh, right? And so the five plus version would be neon uh, 3S2, 3P6. So if I write that in my um, electron orbital diagram, I have 3S, which gets one slash, 3P, which gets three slashes. So I have to put two electrons in the 3S orbital. So one has to go up, one has to go down, that's done. I have to put six electrons in the 3P orbital. So first you put an electron in each dash by itself, then I have to pair them up because I need to have a total of six. So I have three electrons in my 3P orbital. So everything is paired up, right? So I do not have any unpaired electrons. That means, one sec here. That means that this element is not magnetic. So this is a diamagnetic element. Questions on how I did V5 plus? If not, I will let you get two. And I actually have a pull for this one because it's either paramagnetic or diamagnetic. It's a, 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 you only have two possible answers to this. So just to track to see where we are, I'm gonna launch this poll. Once you have answers for everything, please uh, answer the poll if you could. If you have questions as always, um, do let me know as well. But yeah, let's see if we can figure out for our remaining four elements, if we're looking at something that's paramagnetic, which is magnetic or diamagnetic, which is not magnetic.
So it's okay if you're still working. Um, I'm gonna do B because it seems like the majority of us have that, but just in case, you, in case you're still struggling a little bit, uh, chromium three plus has the electron configuration, uh, argon, 3D3. We write out the 3D orbital. There's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, right? So that has unpaired electrons. So that makes it paramagnetic. So that's paramagnetic. Let me just end this now because it's been about four and a half minutes. And it seems, okay. So this seems a little bit of confusion on some of these. That's okay. That's why we're in class to try and uh, figure this out, right? So nickel two plus, the electron configuration of nickel two plus is argon. 3d8, right? So we write out the 3d orbital for, uh, so let's see, for nickel. So 3d. The d has five spots and we have to put eight electrons. So first, each electron gets its own slot. That's, that's five. Now we have three left to place. One, two, three. So we have two unpaired electrons. If we have unpaired electrons, that's paramagnetic. So nickel two plus is magnetic. So do not just randomly pair electrons, right? There is an even number here, but remember when we're putting in electrons, electrons want to be by themselves first. They don't want to be paired up if they don't have to be. So C is paramagnetic. Uh, D, iron three plus, uh, the electron configuration of iron three plus is argon, uh, 3D5. So again, 3D orbital, one, two, three, four, five, put five electrons. And this is correct. You should put electrons all by themselves. They should not be paired up yet. You have to put them into empty spaces before you can pair them up. We have unpaired electrons, so that's para, paramagnetic. E, uh, CD2 has the electron configuration of krypton, 3D10. So 3D orbital, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna put five electrons to begin with in their own area. Now I have five more electrons to deal with. One, two, three, four, five. 3D10, so everything's paired up. So that's diamagnetic. All right, any questions about creating our electron diagrams and determining if something's diamagnetic or paramagnetic? All right, if not, we can move on then. Oh, looks like we do have a question. So you just ignore the 4S shell and follow the 3D shell? No, you take electrons out of the 4S shell first. So I'm not ignoring it, right? So let's do nickel two plus. So nickel in the neutral form would be argon, 4S2, 3D8, two plus, I remove them from the 4S shell first because there's two electrons there. So that's why it's argon 3D8. So it's not so much that I'm ignoring the 4S shell is that there's nothing in the 4S shell because uh, we, we take electrons out of the 4S shell first. All right, so moving on.
the last thing, do I want to talk about this? There's three minutes left. Yeah, we can talk about this. It's easy. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is the size of atoms. Um, and this is one of our periodic trends that we have to learn. So basically, when you look at the periodic table, as you go from top to bottom, atoms get bigger, so increasing radius. As you go from right to left, atoms get bigger, increasing radius. And this is for neutral atoms. So what we're looking at is neutral atoms only. As you go down the periodic table, neutral atoms get bigger. As you go to the left on the periodic table, neutral atoms get bigger. So Rb, which is in the bottom left of the periodic table, is going to be your biggest. And then helium, which is in the top right, is going to be your smallest. So that's the trend of atomic size in um, the periodic table. So relatively uh, simple uh, trend there. But the last thing I'm going to ask you is just pick what atom is larger based on what I just said. So I have a poll for this, and this will be our last question. Every scenario except F, I give you two electrons. You tell me what the biggest is, reminding yourself that as you go down, increases. Size increases. As you move to the left, it increases. So see if we can't figure out which atoms are larger. And, and to help you out with this, I will actually tell you what numbers they are, these are. So aluminum is 13, IN is 49, silicon is 14, and is, now I'm just writing down the electron uh, or the atomic number for these elements so you can find them faster on your periodic table. Phosphorus is 15, lead is 82. Carbon is six, fluorine is nine. Uh, tin is 50, silicon is 14. So which atom is the larger out of every pair? All right, since time is winding up here, it seems um, general we, we have it down. So uh, IN, uh, indium, is two uh, rows below aluminum. So it is the larger atom because it's below aluminum. Uh, silicon is below nitrogen and to the left, so it's bigger. Lead is below phosphorus and to the left, so it's bigger. Uh, carbon is to the left of fluorine, so it's bigger. Tin is below silicon, so it's bigger. And if I'm going to arrange these in order from um, small to large, you start at the top right and work your way down to the bottom left. So the order should go F, S, S, I, C, A, and F. R, B, and I did not, I skipped over G, E. Um, so G, E, where are you, G, E? Oh, G, I, G, E should be after S, I. So G, E, C, A, R, B. Any questions with determining which atom is larger?
So if there's not any questions, um, that's all I have for you today. Um, as always, I will put up a homework assignment. Um, if you have questions, as always, feel free to reach out to me by email. Otherwise, I'll see you all um, in two days from now. Have a good rest of your day, everybody.